Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another dip into the archive. Recently, I overheard a conversation between two tourists who were looking at visiting St. Augustine. They mentioned that a one night stay in the city would be enough to see everything. That's a surprising comment considering the 100 plus things people can do in St. Augustine. For its size, the city of 14,000 is easily the most tourist oriented in the Sunshine State. I've talked about St. Augustine on this channel a number of times since it's a remarkable place filled with hundreds and hundreds of years of history. Everyone should agree that the city is old, at least in respect to North American settlements. It had its start in 1565 when the conquistador Admiral Pedro Menendez sailed into the inlet along with a fleet of ships holding a thousand sailors, soldiers, and settlers. The Spanish settlement and garrison was built in the former Timucua village of Seloy. While it was once commonly known as the oldest city in the U.S. and the nation's oldest city, St. Augustine is better described as the oldest continuously occupied city of European origin in the contiguous U.S. Puerto Rico's capital, San Juan, is actually the oldest in the entire U.S., having been founded in 1521. St. Augustine's origin is attested to by undeniable archaeological evidence and hundreds of pages of first-hand documents created by its early settlers, and it's not uncommon for visitors to get the mistaken impression that the streets they walk on and the buildings they explore date from the city's first decades. They're not. The city itself is old, but the St. Augustine of today would mostly begin taking shape in the late 17th century with the oldest structures originating just prior to 1800. Construction began on the Castillo de San Marcos in 1672, replacing a wooden fort. The Castillo, the oldest masonry fort in the continental U.S., is roughly the starting point of the look of the modern city. With the ever-present threat to the British, Spain would fortify St. Augustine over the next century using native coquina stone quarried on Anastasia Island. Spain's northernmost outpost on the Atlantic would become a fortified city, though one where most of the buildings were still built of wood. Our next important date is 1702. During the siege of St. Augustine, British colonists from the province of Carolina attempted to capture the Castillo, but after 58 days they retreated. During the retreat, the town was burned, which destroyed nearly all of 17th century St. Augustine. Coquina stone would be used to rebuild much of the city. Today, I want to look at five interesting buildings, each one important because of their history as well as their impact on tourism. While they aren't anywhere near 450 years old, they are the oldest in their respective categories. When you visit St. Augustine, the term old is everywhere, and each of these buildings have it in their name. Here are the buildings. The old curiosity shop, the oldest wooden schoolhouse, the oldest store, the old jail, and the oldest house. The old curiosity shop is the only one that isn't open anymore, though the building is still around and continues to be a store. It's known as the Paredes Dodge House, named after two of its more significant owners. Built in 1803, the Paredes Dodge House is a one-and-a-half story Spanish colonial building located at 54 St. George Street, one of 36 surviving buildings dating from the city's colonial period prior to 1821. An immigrant, Mallorcan sailor Juan Paredes, purchased the land in 1803 and built the home flush with the wall of the neighboring Rodriguez Avero Sanchez House. Paredes lived in the home with his wife and his daughter until his death in 1813. The building passed through a series of owners before it was purchased in 1900 by James Dodge, who was a jeweler. Because of St. Augustine's sudden tourist popularity in the late 19th century, St. George Street largely progressed from residential to commercial. Dodge operated a jewelry store and curiosity shop out of the property. 
The name Old Curiosity Shop comes from the 1840 Charles Dickens novel of the same name. Note the curious spelling of curiosity on the face of the building. As far as I can tell, there's no mention as to why this odd spelling was chosen. The maps and guides in the archive use the regular spelling of curiosity. Dodge promoted it as the oldest house in the U.S., suggesting it had been built as early as 1565, the year of St. Augustine's founding. Of course, the house is old, but it's not even the oldest structure on the block. As I mentioned, it was constructed directly next to the Rodriguez Avero Sanchez house, whose first floor was built as early as 1753. James Dodge died in 1934, and his widow Emma subsequently sold the house to the St. Augustine Historical Society. The Historical Society sold it to the historic St. Augustine Preservation Board in 1988, and when the Preservation Board was closed in 97, it became the property of the state of Florida. It's managed by the University of Florida's historic St. Augustine. The Paredes Dodge House is characteristic of the city's colonial Spanish architecture. It's set directly onto the street and is built of coquina covered in stucco. The original building had two rooms and had two more rooms added in the back. A second front door was added to the building in the late 1800s and there are three dormers facing the street. Considered wall dormers, they're different from typical dormers which are set partway up the slope of the roof. These wall dormers have their windows at the front of the building. The face of the dormer is essentially the continuation of the wall above the level of the eaves. Located just up the street from the old curiosity shop is the oldest wooden schoolhouse. It's at 14 St. George Street, only a few feet away from the old city gates. Known as the Genopoly House, after its builder Juan Genopoly, the structure is the oldest wood frame building in St. Augustine, having been built around 1804. Yet another immigrant, Genopoli was a Greek carpenter who originally came to Florida as part of the British attempts at creating a colony south of St. Augustine at New Smyrna. When that colony failed, many of the Greek immigrants moved to St. Augustine. Records show Genopoli purchased the land in 1778, but didn't build the current house for some 20 years. Like the old curiosity shop, it was a home until the early 20th century, and Genopoli, his wife, and two of his children taught in a school he opened in the house to teach Greek children a basic education, including English. This was in the mid-1800s, with the last class taught in the midst of the Civil War in 1864. William J. Harris purchased the house and in 1931 began operating it as a historic schoolhouse. Harris is someone I'll do a video on one of these days. He was a photographer who probably did more than anyone else to promote St. Augustine at the start of the 20th century because of his photos and the number of booklets and magazines in which they were featured. Like many of the buildings in the city, the schoolhouse was once thought to be older than it actually is. Early tourist brochures mention that a Spanish map dating to 1788 shows the house and unfortunately as of 2023 the Wikipedia page on the schoolhouse states it could date back to 1716 even though the official oldest wooden schoolhouse website states otherwise. In reality, this property, on one of the main streets and near to the city gates in the Castillo, has been the site of a number of buildings. The early house mentioned on the 1788 map was probably the house Juan Genopoli purchased along with the property and which he'd eventually replace in 1804. The house has continued to operate as a tourist attraction since 1931. Harris would sell the property to St. Augustine Mayor Walter Frazier. It's a wood frame structure built of red cedar and cypress and put together with wooden pegs. It features a shingled gable roof with a steep pitch of 47 degrees and a long cat slide on the rear of the house. The cat slide's a type of roof that slopes downward on one side of a building and extends past the exterior wall to create a sheltered area. 
there's a dormer on both the front and the rear of the roof. Like the ones in the old curiosity shop, they're wall dormers, but they're also shed dormers, having a single flat plane roof sloping the same direction as the principal roof, but at a shallower angle. By the way, the chain encircling the building appears sometime in the early 1950s, and it's said that it was attached to the anchor in case of a hurricane. Not sure how true that is. For the oldest store, the story is less about the building than its contents. Unlike the two previous buildings, you visit the oldest store for all the weird and unusual things you can find inside. It opened as an attraction around 1960, though its history goes back to the mid-1800s. Around 1840, records show that there was a B.E. Carr Lumber Company located on Riberia Street. In 1875, Charles Ferdinand Hamblin purchased Carr's Lumber Company. Born in 1837, Hamblin was a general store owner in Stillwater, Maine. After the Civil War, he moved south to St. Augustine and he'd continue to operate the lumber company. From there, he added a general store, grocery, and hardware store. By 1890, it's thought he owned the largest hardware and building supply business in St. Augustine. The store moved several times to locations, including across from the Plaza de la Constitución, a building which was destroyed in the 1887 fire. It would also operate on Bay Street and later Avile Street. Hamlin also had several warehouses for his stock. One was on Artillery Lane. St. John's County records show that warehouse was built in 1885. Hamlin died in 1920 at 83 years old. His family would continue the business, and they moved it to the Artillery Lane property around 1930. Fred and Bill Green bought it around 1960. It would be these brothers who would convert the store into a museum while opening a smaller hardware store at a different location. The Greens were from Wilmington, Delaware, and had moved to St. Augustine after World War II. Yes, more immigrants. The idea for the museum was obvious to the Greens when they first walked around the store. It was common knowledge that Charles Hamblin never threw anything away. Hamblin kept warehouses full of old stock. They were filled with horse tack, mule harnesses, barrels, ship models, wagons, furniture, goat-powered washing machines, high-wheeled bicycles, blacksmith tools, buggies, spinning wheels, toys, patent medicines, guns, plows, bolts of fabric, rope, long underwear, corsets, steam tractors, coffee grinders, and Edison phonographs. There was a hundred thousand items waiting for the greens, and when they started to dig through the inventory, they didn't know what they'd find. One day, they even found a pit that had been boarded over. Once the boards were removed, they discovered more items, including 20 millstones. Possibly the most famous item at the store is the Cigar Store Indian, who stands on the porch. It's the work of Tom Rayner, better known as the founder of Flagler College's theater department, where he's Professor Emeritus. In 1963, as a teacher at St. Augustine High School, he sculpted the Indian, a life-size horse, a hound dog, and a cat crawling up into a cracker barrel and did a few repairs to items in the oldest store. The Indian was carved from a 1,400-pound or 635-kilogram log that Fred Green had bought. Rayner recalled that it was a green log and ended up taking well over a 1,000 pounds off of it. Green sold the oldest store to Carl Miller in the late 1980s, who ran it as a country store, before selling it to Old Town Trolley Tours, which also operates the Old Jail and the St. Augustine History Museum. The company moved the museum, lock, stock, and barrel, to their property at the northern end of the Old City area. Known today as the oldest store museum experience, it reopened in 2011 with a two-story wood building that for many years housed Herbie Wilde's insurance company. When it comes to old buildings in St. Augustine, the old jail isn't one. Still, it was built in 1891, so it's over 130 years old. 
It has a fascinating heritage, too. If we go back a few years further to the mid-1880s, St. Augustine was a small, fairly sleepy city that was on the verge of being discovered by wealthy families from the Northeast who didn't know that Florida is where they'd spend their winters for the next few decades. Enter Henry Flagler, a founder of Standard Oil and one of the richest people in the world. Flagler would visit St. Augustine, and while he loved the climate and the city itself, he felt that the hotel facilities and transportation systems were inadequate. Flagler saw a financial opportunity and got to work. By 1890, he built two large and well-appointed resort hotels, the Ponce de Leon and the Alcazar, and linked the city's existing rail lines with Jacksonville and the steamship lines. This transformed St. Augustine into the number one location for the ultra-wealthy to become snowbirds. At the time, the St. John's County Jail was located in the Old City, and it just happened to be next to Flagler's Ponce de Leon Hotel. Flagler never liked that, since it wasn't the kind of view his wealthy patrons cared to look upon from their windows, so he offered to fund the building of a new county jail as long as it was built out of sight. Not surprisingly, the county agreed. The new St. John's County Jail was designed and built by the Pauley Jail Building Company under Flagler's supervision. The Pauley Company was founded in 1856 by P.J. Pauley Sr. of St. Louis, Missouri. Pauley and his family were steamboat blacksmiths and had the skills to design and build steel cages that could be mounted on flatbed wagons to create portable jail cells. As time passed, the company became one of the most successful in jail and prison construction. Today, Robert James Poor and Joseph Pauley Poor III, P.J. Pauley's great-great-grandsons, continue to run the successful company. A few years ago, I was doing some research on the old jail and corresponded with a representative of the Pauley Company. Among the questions I had for them was something I saw on the old jail's website, which continues to be there. I mentioned that the Pauley Company was also responsible for construction of Alcatraz, the notorious federal prison in San Francisco Bay. However, while Polly has built a long list of prisons and jails in its 167-year history, it definitely did not work on Alcatraz. While it's unclear who suggested and approved the jail's plan, knowing Flagler's hands-on approach, he most likely had a hand in it. Designed in the then-popular Romanesque revival style, it's thought that part of the idea was to make the building look more like a hotel than a jail. Located just outside the old city area, as Flagler wanted, it was still placed in a developed area near the La Leche Shrine and the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, which opened in 1885. The Romanesque revival style was widely used for churches, government buildings, and colleges. It developed in the 1830s and remained popular until about 1900, making the St. John's County Jail one of the later examples and one of the few examples of Romanesque revival in Florida. It's noted for heavy stone walls, a castle-like exterior, steeply pitched roofs, rounded arches, and towers. In the old jail, the design looks more like a church than a castle. The facility transitioned from working jail to jail museum in 1954. This meant that there were little changes made, and it remains today as an excellent example of a late 19th century jail that had never been repurposed prior to preservation, one of the few in the country. And finally, we reach the oldest house, and, spoiler alert, it's actually the oldest, at least in Florida. Probably built in 1723, the only older structure in the state is the Castillo. Known as the Gonzalez Alvarez House, it sits on St. Francis Street at the southern end of the city. Like the other buildings, it sits on property that likely has had several earlier buildings on it. We know that the Kern home was built sometime after 1702 when the British siege turned the entire city to ashes. While the old curiosity shop and oldest school date from the second Spanish colonial period, 
1723 marks the Gonzalez Alvarez house as a representative of the first Spanish period. The two-story shingled structure shows several different influences. It began as a one-story house built of coquina and tabby, which is a mortar made of sand, crushed and burned shells, and water. You can learn more about tabby in this video on the Braden Castle. Tomas Gonzalez y Hernandez, who was born in the Canary Islands, yet another immigrant, and his wife Francisca de Guevara owned the house. It's thought that he might have acquired it through marriage. Gonzalez was an artillery man stationed at the Castillo. Gonzalez and his family called the house home until 1763 when Spain turned Florida over to Britain. Because of the change, most Spanish inhabitants moved to Cuba. The house became the property of Major Joseph Pivot, who was the paymaster for the English military in the Castillo, which was now called Fort St. Mark. Pevet built the wooden second floor and added glass windows where latticework had been and fireplaces to replace the Spanish braziers. He died in 1785 and his widow Maria would be forced to sell the house in 1790 to pay the debts of her second husband, John Hudson. This was after the British returned Florida to the Spanish and it was purchased by Geronimo Alvarez, who was originally from Spain. Sadly, Maria and John had to be evicted by order of Florida's governor because they refused to leave the house. The Alvarez family would own the house up to 1882. Afterwards, it passed through a number of owners. In 1918, the house became the headquarters of the St. Augustine Historical Society and was eventually restored to its late 18th century appearance. As you can see in early images, there are two different dormers in the roof making it technically a two-and-a-half-story house. The two dormers, one an eyebrow dormer, would be removed in the 1920s. There were also tiny triangular dormers on the two ends of the house that were removed. For many years, the Gonzalez Alvarez house was not only considered the oldest house in St. Augustine, but the oldest in the U.S., for example, a 1912 St. Augustine souvenir booklet unequivocally states that it is without a doubt the oldest building in America, the records of which are preserved in the archives of the church at Rome. It was erected by the monks of St. Francis who came to St. Augustine with Menendez and used by them as a chapel until 1590 when they moved to their larger monastery. Up to 1856, this was the only coquina building in St. Augustine, and it was the only one that escaped total destruction when Sir Francis Drake made his raid in the city that year. Thankfully, in the 20th century, we saw the developments of scientific archaeology, and like much of St. Augustine, trained historians have been able to conduct extensive research that shows what the house's actual age is and how it fits within the colonial St. Augustine style of architecture. These five attractions, along with their mostly immigrant builders and owners, are an interesting cross-section of older attractions in Florida's oldest city and cover 300 of the more than 450 years that St. Augustine has existed. Visiting the oldest house and school illustrates two of the main building styles in the Spanish colonial period, styles that originated well before these homes were built. Meanwhile, the old jail can provide a different perspective of the city's Henry Flagler years. I encourage you to check out these attractions next time you visit St. Augustine. They're filled with history and have very knowledgeable guides. Thank you for watching another of my videos. If you learned something, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.